Yeah, so everyone, thanks for tuning in today. Um, good evening, your time, uh, Sunday morning for me. And I'm yeah, happy to kind of talk about a lot of cool stuff related to Power BI. Um, as you know, I already mentioned kind of some visualization tips and tricks and uh, just a lot of ways to kind of, you know, use use the features available in Power BI to come up with some unique solutions and patterns to just, you know, create things that can either be more meaningful as far as the story that it's trying to tell with your data um, or just uh, be able to kind of um, almost create new things with the combination of some other stuff. So before I get started, though, as well, I just want to give a little bit of background about myself. Um, I've been doing uh, data analytics and kind of reporting um, related to business intelligence for probably the last it's hard to keep track now, like in nine years, I think. Um, I started working with Power BI um, when it came out as Power BI designer, like six, uh, six years ago at this point, and basically kind of slowly migrated from Excel to that environment. And um, honestly, a lot of the stuff that I do today, I kind of just found myself falling into in a, in a sense where, uh, you know, I, I started just you know, doing analytics and basic number crunching in Excel, as I'm sure a lot of, of us have done, you know, just pivot tables and you know, maybe some spark lines and stuff like that. But the more I started to build out reports, the more I just noticed that people uh, kind of continued to lean on me for for advice on on that, and it just it almost became like a specialty that uh, I found that just came with somewhat naturally to me uh, and something I really enjoyed. So you know, more often than not, I, I see a large portion of reports that are out there that it, you know the model's built well, it's uh, it has good data that's accurate, but it's not always presented in a way that e that a either makes sense, you know, and is as far as like the right visual being used or it maybe it's it doesn't quite have that like extra polish that that comes from needing to have more of a design brain. You know, it's the left and right brain of kind of the um, the artistic versus the more scientific and, and math based. And I've I've found that I've, I'm kind of able to hang out in in both quadrants a bit. Um, but I, I do a lot of development and training. Uh, I do a substantial amount of these user groups as well. Something I really enjoy. It's also one of the reasons that I'm I'm able to get like an MVP award every year for Microsoft is for community contributions. So presented at conferences, uh, making a lot of YouTube content as well that I have. Um, I have a video that goes out most Tuesdays uh, just on a tutorial on something. And this year I've also been doing a lot of live streams with a lot of uh, in industry professionals. So people who work at Microsoft, uh, quite a few of the people on the Power BI team, other MVPs or industry professionals by myself. Um, it's a new format that I've, I've been really enjoying. And you know, I basically kind of have a, almost in a way a user group meeting where basically have somebody come on, people can tune into those. Um, I'll have a slide at the very end of my presentation that will have a bunch of links abil available for you. So um, there will also be a, a link to the YouTube channel that will uh, give you access to a lot of uh, the, the free content that I put out every week um, on top of this as well. All right, so let's kind of go over what we'll be talking about today. Um, so this, uh, this presentation that I have is one that I've been doing for a few years now. And um, for anybody, in the audience who's familiar with like Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, I kind of equate this presentation to like a candy that he had in, in that uh, in the movie or the books where he had something called an everlasting gobstopper, but it was this magic candy that each time you ate it, it had a different flavor. It was the same candy, but it always would have a different taste each time. That's kind of what happens with this presentation because it it's a rolling list of a lot of topics and features that I like and that I've found out how to do. So every, you know, few months or so as I do a new YouTube video, find something new and cool to do in Power BI, I'll rotate out something from this list, put in a new uh, cool new feature. So it's, it's pretty much going to continuously be a core presentation of mine that's just the, the latest and greatest of things that I've found that have been fun and unique uh, to build in Power BI. So if you happen to see this again in a year somewhere else, or if I present here again, um, if it happens to be the same topic, I have a few others. You know, good chance there'll be 40 to 60 percent new information in here just because I, I keep evolving this as it goes, goes on. The other nice thing is it's very modular, a lot of uh, demos in here, so I can scale it down to 30 minutes, I can scale it up to an hour and a half. Uh, we'll probably not get through everything because I built it large enough to scale up to an hour and a half if I have like a large conference that I'm presenting at. Um, we'll probably get through about mm, maybe down to the matrix or, the, or to the line chart KPI. Um, but I'll also have links at the end to take you to videos to watch some of the other demonstrations in here um, if you so choose afterwards. So there'll be some supplemental material as well. Uh, but this is go going to be mostly demo driven. So I'm just going to go ahead and switch over to uh, Power BI Desktop and then um, kind of start with uh, some of these cool tips and tricks that I want to show you. Let's see, number one, there we go. All right, and uh, yeah, let's start with the line chart. Zoom, it should be working. 
There we go. Perfect. So in the line chart here, you notice that there's a bunch of KPI dots that are on this. Um, this specific uh, demonstration has actually been in this presentation since day one. And at some point with a lot of these demos, they're kind of ways to show you something clever that's not necessarily intuitive to apply in, in Power BI, but it's available. And that's why I demonstrated it. Is it it's not like an easily found toggle switch that has to be turned on. It, there's usually a couple steps. Uh, I would love it with if, if quite a few of these eventually get phased out, like Microsoft, let's say, updates Power BI to make this easier. That's great. Like I, I, I would love these to come out because that means that I don't have to present it to people anymore. They can easily find it. This is still one that is not available today as an easy, easily found solution. And I'll walk you through the reasons why. Because natively, the line chart, if you come over to the visualizations pane, and you go over to the format tab, you will not actually have an option for any kind of conditional formatting. Typically, if you had the ability to apply conditional formatting to any kind of color in here, you would see a little box right here with an F of X symbol that would allow you to apply some kind of rule based logic to change the colors. It's not available on this visual. Uh, so the actually the way that I discovered this was in a sense an, uh, a happy accident. I was building a report and I had started with a different visual. So it actually started. There we go. Okay. I had started with a clustered column chart. Here, notice that there is an F of X symbol in the data colors. So from this perspective, I started with a different visual and converted it. And I noticed that when I did that, the KPI, uh, the colors that I set up based on rules, migrated over with it. Uh, just to give you an example of what that uh, rule screen looks like, uh, really less important about what the rules are as much as there's just some type of conditional formatting logic being applied to this. And in the conversion process, like, oh, that ended up getting converted to dots that are on the line chart. Now, this is one of those moments where if you notice something like this, where you ask yourself, is this a bug or a feature? That's kind of a, a good moment to pause and maybe consider Googling it to see if anybody else has discovered this feature. Has there been any, been any blogs written about it? Um, in this case, uh, a couple of people had um, written about this feature uh, that I d discovered myself. And I also did my own due diligence and I emailed um, Microsoft because I, I do have somewhat of a communication channel with the Power BI team. And, and I asked them like, hey, is this a feature that's ever going to be um, fixed? You know, are you going to uh, do an update to get rid of all these? And um, they confirmed with me that it won't go away. And the reason I'm doing this is as a developer, it takes a long time, a lifetime to build trust with the client and it takes a second to lose it. You don't want to, you know, ideally you want to avoid situations where you deploy a feature to a production report that let's say in two months, it just goes away. So now you have to explain to the client that, you know, that it's out of our hands. This feature that you liked is now gone. Microsoft patched it. So I wanted to confirm first before presenting on it, putting it into any production reports that this is a stable feature. So it's still not a perfect scenario where it, um, it, it is hidden and you have to develop it by starting with one visual, applying the conditional formatting and then changing it to a line chart. It will be stable, it will stay in there and it will apply that color logic basically into the bands that I created, which were the upper, middle and lower. You know, that you got the highs, the middle and the low, just so it does kind of help to tell a better story of the, the ranges that you might want to identify in the into the data itself. Um, the one downside to this, I will say, um, the play devil's advocate is there's not much formatting or adjustment that you can do. The one thing that you can set are the colors. You can choose what the colors for them will be. You can't change the shapes. So I, have, I don't have an ability to tell these to be a square or a diamond or any other shape, and I can't determine the size. Those are both things that are just hard coded. But otherwise, if, um, if you find value to add to a line chart to include any KPIs like this, then the solution will be implemented well, and um, it's not gonna break when you publish this to the service or deploy this for any client or uh, company that you're building these for. And if you ever need to edit it in the future, kind of the way that I've just shown you, you need to change the logic basically swap it back to that visual, open up the conditional formatting uh, window to make your edits here, and then just convert it back to the line chart itself. And then it, that will basically then commit the changes as you publish it back to the service. So pretty easy to set up, um, but it's one of those, yeah, you wouldn't know to look for it. And until I, again, stumbled across it by accident or Googled a, a solution for this, it wouldn't have been something that I would have just found intuitively just because it, nobody would think to start with one visual to be able to, to migrate those features over to a different one. But it is something that is a somewhat hidden feature in Power BI. A uh, couple of other, couple of other things that I'll mention here as well uh, before I close out this demo 
is there is another feature that I really liked that came out a couple of years ago now in Power BI, um, but this used to be substantially harder to do as a feature before this came out. So prior to visual header tooltips, which is what you're seeing now, to get any kind of feature like this, you'd basically have to add like an image, a little icon image to the page, put it on in the corner of the visual. Then when you clicked that, it would activate a bookmark that would pop up, basically unhide a text box that would show up. So you, you would have to, from scratch, like piece by piece, make your own pop-up window. And I've done that with a lot of reports to you know, have little helper windows to explain the data in the report. Microsoft realized that a lot of people were doing this and they created Visual Header Tooltip um, in Power BI. Now, some of the workarounds that I have in here um, are things that I will walk you through. Now, the first one that I just want to show kind of as a, to me, it's a bit of a grievance of, I don't think they deploy the feature to turn it on very well. I, I like the feature itself, but not always is it easy to find. It was, you've just seen with the, the line chart conditional formatting. Um, so with uh, the Visual Header Tooltip, let me uh, point out something. If we go into the corner over here, move that out of the way, um, we have a menu for Visual Header Tooltip down here. Now, basically everything else, almost all these other menus, just have an on or off radio switch that's next to it. For whatever reason, instead of deciding to put one here just to turn off this menu, whether or not you want it visible or not, the way to actually get it to show up, you have to first come to your Visual Header menu. All the way down at the bottom is the Visual Header Tooltip toggle. So if that's off, it's not even down here at the bottom. You don't even see it in the menu. It's just simply not there. Now, I don't know about you, um, but I, I would argue that most people don't go through and look at every single option in, in the, the menu for their for their format settings. So it's kind of a buried option all the way down, way at the bottom. You know, and you have to scroll down to the very end to turn that on to toggle it there. So you know, my, my feedback to them has just been, can, just take this, and just put that on here. Keep the keep the menu open at all times. Just simply have the toggle on the menu itself. They haven't done it yet. I'm hoping they do, but it, it's a little bit buried, um, in my opinion. So at least that you've seen where to turn it on. Let me show you a couple of other things as the reasons that I'm doing this demonstration. So by default, what you have if you just do a standard tooltip, something like this, you have the ability to uh, put a tooltip in here. However, you are limited to 250 characters. You can't have any more than that, and you can't format it or anything else. It's standard text, and this is just generated text that I've thrown in here. But in this, there's just a 250 character limit of whatever you type in. So uh, these are notes. There, it just shows up just as the standard um, text. And you have a bit of formatting for color and size, but again, you can't like underline a certain word. There's no, ital um, uh, you can't italicize, you can't choose the alignment. It's very basic. Uh, text input that can go into here. Now, if you want to get around that, you have the ability to attach a report tooltip page to, um, to the visual itself. So in this case, I have a tooltip page called info tooltip. Uh, attach that there. You can see that I now have more than 250 characters in here. So all that is, come back down, my info tooltip page. I built a report tooltip page in here, and basically I just put a text box in, into it, colored the background the same, but the nice thing about this with any report page tooltip is this just is a report page. I have the option to add any visual that I want onto here. If I wanted to, I could you know, drop this down. I could add a little company icon up there in the corner. I have full customization over this page, just like any other report page tooltip that I have to, to do anything I want with uh, as far as the designer formatting. You know, I have the ability to underline and, and bold. If I wanted to, I could center align all of this. So I get a lot more formatting flexibility in here to highly customize this as needed. The only things you need to do, by the way, if you are unfamiliar with report page tooltips, when you create a new page, let me just, as an example, I'll create a brand new page here. The settings that you would apply, just come over to format for the page, make sure that the information is set to tooltip on, and then you also wanna make sure your page size is set to tooltip. Because what that does is that gives you a width of 320 by 240, it gives you a smaller box. If you wanted to, you can also customize that. Like you can actually make it wider, you can make it taller, but in general, it just gives you a three by two ratio uh, tooltip page. Um, and then the last thing that's usually recommended is you go to view, page view, and then you say actual size. <clears throat> there you go. You can see, <clears throat> excuse me, that the actual size of it is, you know, this is basically what it's gonna be represented on when you put it onto a new page. So just a 
quickly give you an example of some data in here. I will put in there you go, text box. Let's type some information in there. So whatever you want to customize, and then you have the option on any page to then set that for the visual itself. I have the info tooltip on there, but it's a, it's a simple matter of going back to that format and under visual header tooltip, you can choose, as you can see, as long as you mark that page setting as tooltip on, that page will show up into here. And that applies to this, or if you're just doing a regular tooltip on the visual, but that's how it knows to show it in the list of attachable items, like page one, the one that I just created, there you go, showing up onto the page. So it is, I would say the one downside is the, you know, per visual that you have a unique tooltip explanation of, you will, <clears throat> so, sorry, need one of those uh, report tooltip pages created in your report and, you know, you need to hide it. But as far as file size or anything else goes, it doesn't add that much size to the model. You basically have a page with a bit of text, maybe an image onto there, um, and it's pretty quick and easy to set up. But I find it pretty valuable to be able to have a tooltip page that provides some additional information into there if you need additional formatting options outside of just, like I mentioned, that 250 character limit. Um, now, overall, uh, those are the two primary things I wanted to show as part of demonstration number one. Uh, with any of these demonstrations, I also like to give space for questions at the end. So if you have any general questions related to either of the two things that I just talked about, conditional formatting or report tooltips, uh, feel free to just take yourself off of mute um, or type them into the chat window. Um, otherwise, I can also go um, into the next demo as well. So I'll give um, a minute or so for questions at this point. Anything in the chat window? Uh, not yet. Uh, no problem. Okay. No, no, nothing yet in the chat window. Anybody have any question? This is your chance to ask before we move to the, the next stage. Yep. Do again. Yep. You can ask towards the end. Yeah, exactly. And I'll also have uh, I'll have time at the very end for uh, general questions for things related either to what I presented on or just general Power BI questions that you're welcome to, to ask towards. Uh, at the very end of, of all of this. So I'll go ahead and close this then and go on to demonstration number two. Let's see. Where are we at? Aha. Yes. So this was one that I actually did earlier this year. So this is a recent addition to this presentation. And it's one of the, the I'd say the more interesting ones that I've done recently. So with a lot of things in Power BI, there is usually a mixture of trying to do things in-house, meaning use the native features that are available in Power BI versus adding images and other stuff. So I, what I ended up building for a client based on a request was this little toggle switch that we see. Let's lock these objects uh, right here. So basically created a little, I uh, used uh, buttons, native buttons in Power BI to create a toggle that allows me to change between visuals. It's less important what I'm changing of, I'm just showing an, uh, a scenario of a bookmark toggling visuals, but the the goal of this is, just, is to show you how much you can customize a button to service whatever look and feel that you want. There's so many ways to customize them as far as the features go, but I was very happy that I was able to figure out a way to create this shape from a, um, a native uh, item in Power BI Desktop. So I'm going to show you how to build that. What we actually have in here is two of those buttons. I've enlarged them a little bit for demonstration purposes, but what we do is um, each of these buttons, when you toggle it, it basically they're, they're stacked on top of each other and I can actually show you here if I open up my selection pane, visuals, there we go. Notice that there is a, a group called area buttons and column buttons, and then hidden showing, hidden showing. So if I activate this, watch basically how all these will change. So I click that, there we go. So now this is visible, that's hidden, that's hidden, and this is visible. So there's two sets of everything, and that's like how it how the button looks like it's changing. Essentially what happens is when I activate the bookmark, this one that's sitting on top of this becomes invisible, this one becomes visible. So the effect that's achieved for the client is the button looks like it's moved over physically, but there's two versions of the same button that basically toggle visibility with the bookmark. It's the, it's the way to kind of achieve a activated and non-activated button effect. But I will start with one of these at a time. So I'm gonna select this, go ahead and copy that visual and move this over here so we can kind of observe all the formats and everything that I did for this. So for, uh, buttons themselves, if you are not familiar with them, have a, a few different states. 
that can be applied as far as formatting goes. There is the default state, which is what the button looks like when you're not, your mouse isn't over it and it's not clicking on it. There is the on hover state, which as the name implies, what happens when you hover over it with your mouse. And then there's the press state, so when you click it. So three different primary states that can each be formatted. So the button can be designed to look like something natively, something when you uh, design a certain way when you hover and design a certain way when you click it. So I basically have from left to right, a click effect, and then same thing with the opposite one, just reversed order, uh, native on click or on hover and on press. So I'm going to go over to here and kind of walk you through the formatting. And again, I, I love buttons for how highly customizable they can be as far as many of the options are in here. And you can see that in, in the states in the top, we have our default on hover and on press. I really do think this should be click. I know they say press, but you know, I, I feel like click is uh, much more easily understood uh, terminologies, uh, certainly for, for mice. But between those three states, uh, what I ended up putting in here instead of text is, and I need to zoom out for this. If you press the Windows key and semicolon, you'll get a menu for an emoji keyboard on the Windows uh, computer. And I just typed in circle. When you type, whatever you type in, notice is the, if I zoom in for a quick sec, the text right there, it actually uh, pulls up a bunch of circles that you have for here. So I ended up just going with a white circle kind of as the button slider for there. Get rid of that again. There you go. And that's basically my toggle button. And between each of the states, notice that default, I choose right alignment. On hover is center alignment. So that is center. So it's basically it's moving the button over. And then on press, left alignment. So there's the left one. So you can see how between each three state, I basically allow it to, to move and toggle from one side to the other. And I've applied similar logic to the other states that are in uh, the outline. And this is actually something that I did because, uh, again, I wanted to create a round button. So you have the ability to actually round the edges in the button visual. If I put this back to zero, notice that it's, you know, it's just a square button now. So the, the way to get that um, effect was to go to outline, make sure that was turned on, and then put that at 20. And that doesn't change between all um, three states. The thing that does change, though, is notice that I have blue. I picked gray in the middle for kind of a neutral color between blue and, and purple, and then purple for the left side color. So that can also be observed. Default is blue, hover is gray, and then on press is purple. So three different colors, three different states. And these can all be independently colored. Um, and just as a reminder, every time you see one of these, that means that you can apply conditional formatting to it. So if you wanted to, you could actually have some kind of a measure logic that could tr maybe change it from red to green depending on the, st the status or the, the the state of a certain number so you could you could make it more dynamic rather than fixed if you wanted to somehow provide color formatting to maybe indicate good or bad or positive and negative um, at any point and, and uh, very similar logic applied to the fill default hover and press is just the blue the gray and then the purple that's over there for the three different states that's in that button. So the overall effect then between those two and with a bookmark is the uh, basically toggling the visibility of those two. And just to, last but not least, just to kind of show you the, the outline effect, I'll go ahead and put these two on top of each other and just show you kind of like the, the bookmark activation of that, just for a, a quick um, teaser of this. So we have, not sorry, wrong pain, panel, there we go. So two buttons. We basically have the left and the right one on there, and I'm actually going to name these appropriately. So this one, I'm going to call this left button, call that right button. There we go. So we have the two that are on top of each other. And in any current point, what we would probably want to have um, is getting them grouped together, and I'm just going to call these buttons. There we go. So I'm going to select both of them. And if we're, if we're thinking about two different states that we're toggling, like we're basically toggling the buttons and a visualization to kind of toggle between the two of them, we'd select the visuals and the buttons. And you, for whatever state you're trying to make, if I wanted to, to make my like left button capture state, I would hide the right one. And that's basically, you know, assuming we have a visual as well next to this, these are kind of like in the state that I would want to capture. Um, so in this case, 
we also uh, want to make sure this kind of select the visuals that we um, that we care about. And this this will make sense here in a second. So I'm going to go to bookmarks. I'm going to click add. And let's just call this. Uh, we'll call that left uh, bookmark. There we go. And now I'm just going to flip it. Toggle toggle. There you go. And then add again. Call that one right bookmark. There we go. So now if I unclick that. You can see how it's basically activating between the two of them. Only one is ever visible at a time. And this, assuming we paired it with the visual too, it allows us to show like, you know, the left bookmark state with this button and whatever visual is associated with it, the right bookmark state with that button and whatever is whatever is associated with it. And the reason we also, when I'm doing this, I highlight the objects that I care about is in here, you have a choice of some configurations. So we also have three states, data, display, and current page. Data means that when you create the bookmark, it captures whatever your filter state is. That's your filters pane. That's the slicers in the page. We don't care about updating our filters because this is simply a visibility toggle. So I can turn that off. I also don't care about current page because that will navigate you to the page that that bookmark was created on. It's not relevant to this because the button is on the same page. And then the final thing that I would almost always recommend when you create bookmarks is all ver visuals versus selected. So selected means I can, uh, there we go, one sec, it uh, toggled to the, there we go. All right, there we go, that's what I was trying to do. Selected visuals means that it basically will only update whatever at the time that you made it was highlighted. So it, it helps to kind of provide a protective uh, boundary around it because all of these other visuals that you might have on your page, as far as uh, some of these other ones go, you don't want to accidentally update or, or revert back to settings that um, you don't intend to. So this provides a kind of like, again, a safety net around it's only going to update the visuals that were actively selected in your selection pane at the time of making it. So it's a, it's a safer way to create bookmarks. Bookmarks are those things that I, I love them a lot. I use them in most of the reports that I build, but they can be, it's very nuanced and it, ta it takes uh, you know uh, a lot of care when you make them to make sure they're made exactly right so you don't accidentally update or reset anything else on your page. So that's the reason that um, it's good to select the visuals that you care about and then turn on selected visuals in this option in here. Um, again, that's more of like just a, a quick recap of bookmarks themselves. The primary goal of this one was just to show you how much you can customize the buttons themselves. Um, but overall, are there any questions on this before I move to the next demo? OK, so I have a question. Uh, sure. OK, how did you put the, the texts also, too, so the area chart that changes to the, what's the other one it changes to when you, oh, I see. Oh, this? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so. it's, um, <clears throat> it's just a text box. So similarly, notice that I have, it, it's uh, in, uh, let me use this one. So this here is yeah. just, two, it's two objects. So when I toggle visibility, I'm toggling the visibility of a group. And that is both the button itself and just a text box with the words column chart into there. So, so. Yep. And, and what you can do is when you when you create a bookmark, you don't actually have to necessarily select both of the individual objects in the group. You can simply select the entire group. And at the group level, you can also toggle visibility um, hidden or not. And this is actually a great point. Is one nice thing is if you create a bookmark where you've um, you basically selected at the group level, not the visual level. If I added something new to this group, let's say mm -hmm. I just put this in in here in the future, that now is automatically going to hide or or disappear with the group. So I can mm -hmm. update the bookmark just by adding something new to the group. I don't have to go and use the update bookmark setting. I just have to add new objects to the group. So uh, there's, there's something that's really nice about uh, creating groups is it allows you to put things into there and then automatically will then capture as part of that uh, um, uh, bookmark set in. It's a new one for me, the group. Thanks. Uh, that's the question I have. Uh, I actually have something that I did, that I did this bookmark on to flip between. It's a waterfall chart for a client, and they wanted to compare 
previous year versus the current period, then budget versus current period. And I use this approach, but I'll go change it to this toggle button. So the one I did was just a button that was just obviously button. <laughs> I'm sure once I change it to this, they will know I've gone to something else that must have happened between last week and this week. <laughs> exactly. Thanks. And um, for, for people tuning in too, the, uh, all of these are available to download um, on my website. I have a link at the end. <clears throat> they're all in my blog file section. So um, they're, they'll be available to down, download if you want to get copies of the, these files. All right. Okay, can close that so here. Well. Absolutely. Next one. There we go. Okay. This is one of my favorite ones too. So what we have for this, I'm gonna come over to here. <clears throat> the one that specifically that I want to demo for this is the smart narrative tooltip. So notice uh, the little text box that I have at the top of this uh, report tooltip that I'm showing for this visual. There's a few things that change in it here. The title is going to change. Um, basically, all all of the 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 three visuals that you see on in this card will update as I move around with the filter context. So change to here. Notice that total sales number is changing. The percent value is changing. So you have um, an ability to, to now turn a text box into a visual in the sense that um, you can insert measures directly into it uh, using the Q&A function. They, they added this uh, last November. Or actually, it might have been like September. Um, and it's uh, one thing that I found useful for it is you can actually explain in you know, uh, plain English kind of what the data is, is telling you um, through manual typing into the words, and then you can put some calculations into there that basically accepts the filters that are in here. So I'll, I'll walk you through the all the states that are in, in this visual. Um, and just to, just to show you like exactly what this is, all I'm doing here on the visual itself, the format pane, under the regular tooltip, not the visual header one, you have an option to attach it to a report page. And in this case, that is one of the uh, tooltips that I have available is, is the narrative visual tooltip. And that's what I'm going to be demonstrating to you. That is one of the hidden pages here because again, tooltips, the point of them is to simply be something that shows up with the visual. So they don't, ex the pages themselves never need, need to be visible because you never navigate to that page. They're there to show up as a pop-up on one of these. That's why you would want to hide them in your report. And we've already seen like the way to you know create a page is you you need to make sure that your page information is has tooltip turned on. And then in this case, I actually customized my height and width. I wanted it taller to fit all of these cards. So in this case, I increased the pixels to make it a taller uh, tooltip card to pop up. Now I actually have a few different things in here that's creating each of these uh, visuals. I have a couple of native visuals plus one um, custom visual that's being used into here. This top piece actually, um, interestingly enough, is a button. It is not an actual uh, visual from the visualizations pane. It was something that I added from the, uh, to the insert tab, and then I just put a blank button into here and I did some formatting. The reason I actually really like buttons a lot is there's a lot of customization that you can do that, as an example, the single value card cannot. One of the primary things that I love about buttons is that I can do this. I have the choice for the text in my button to be uh, to have all this different type of alignment. I can have it on the top, middle, or bottom, <clears throat> uh, middle, left, or right as well for the horizontal alignment. And uh, between all of those, it gives me um, a substantial amount of customization. And the nice thing too with the button is you don't just have to have you know standard text into there. <clears throat> you can uh, funnel in using the f of x symbol uh, any other types of information that you want using a measure. And that's what I did in here. I'm going to control Z to get that. Uh, there we go. There we go. All right. So what I have in here is a measure that is returning a concatenated string to basically provide that like friendly text that's at the top there. So all I did in this is I supplied a measure called smart narrative title, and I will show you the measure and kind of explain how that was done. There it is. There we go. The actual DAX measure is pretty pretty straightforward. I'll even actually zoom out and just do this. There we go. So standard text that's here, and then I can con concatenated it with the brand name. And min and max actually doesn't matter. I could also have min in here. The point is, is when I'm hovering over the visual, and I'll show you that in a second, 
there's only one value ever being returned for the brand name or for the class name. So min, max, it doesn't matter. Either way, it's returning one value from this column here and from this column here. So it basically shows me what the class is, what the brand is. And that's how we are getting. If I go back to report. There we go. So if at any point on this visual, <clears throat> if I'm hovering over any of these sections, there is only one value being returned. Uh, let me, where's the, there we go, live annotation. So for this value right here, that is Contoso and that is Deluxe. So like that's why I said it doesn't matter if it's min or max because every single piece of uh, component of this visual that I hover over can only ever return one value. And that's how we get that little concatenated thing at the top, which is right there. We get the Contoso and the Deluxe, but it, it to me, I wanted to provide a, a clear explanation of what filters were being applied to that card that we're looking at. So that's why I used a button to provide that formatting and you know created that DAX measure that basically created this little clean formatted string of text to show brand and class name at the top. And as we can see, each time we move, AdventureWorks, Class Deluxe, ProSwear, Class Regular. So it grabs that information via the filter context being provided by this visual pumped into the uh, report tooltip page. So this gives you a good example of some of the creative ways you can use buttons. They don't just have to be an actual button you click. I, I've used them in a lot of scenarios for other stuff because they just there's so many formatting options for buttons that they can actually turn into visuals in a lot of different ways. The other thing down here, this is the smart narrative tooltip. Sorry, smart narrative visual. It is just a standard text box that you can add into here with the uh, added benefit is that you can do some other things with it uh, to be able to pull data into here. Let me go ahead and get rid of that. Thank you. So it's standard text that you can just type in, like any normal text box. I have the ability to you know, type in the standard text into here. Uh, you've seen me use the emojis before, so this is something that I just, again, I popped up the emoji keyboard. I just wanted to add something to indicate sales, just to spice up the, the text a little bit. Now the parts that are supplied by the, um, the data model are these underlying pieces that I put right here. So this, as an example, is total sales for this month. So the way that I got this, I'm gonna delete that. So how would you calculate this value? I want total sales. So it uses Q&A to retrieve the values from your model. So I could do total sales right there, but I don't want total sales overall. What I want is total sales for the current month, because that's, I'm just, just, just gonna say that that is what I would like for this visual. So the nice thing you can do is you can say, um, this month. So you can see that it gives you an option of not actually applying a filter using Q&A to this. So total sales in this month via the calendar date column. Notice that the number now goes down. So and then I can also if I wanted to, I can format that. It should be currency. So there we go. That's what it should be displayed as. Um, and name of my value, it's going to give it a friendly name. So click save and it pumps that into there. So even though I don't have a measure in my model, that is specifically total sales for the current month, it lets me create that. Now, I will say from a developer perspective, this is not my favorite approach to design. Like Q&A is, is fun, but honestly, Q&A is kind of more of a client facing interface. It's fun for people, it's useful for people who are consuming the model and they wanna be able to type a question in. When I develop though, I, I don't wanna have to type in and grab um, the measures that I want to. Honestly, I should just be able to come over to here and say, you know what, hey, in this visual, I want this measure into here. And I should be able to just drag and drop somehow the measure from my model into, into the visual. So there's been a bit of feedback from myself and other MVPs. Like I should really just be able to come over here and drag and drop. You know, that's that's how you develop in Power BI. So uh, I love the feature. Again, you know, and we've seen this in some other scenarios. The feature is amazing. The way that you add the feature it could use some improvement. So I'm hoping that they provide a new way besides simply just Q and A, because it's I I don't prefer it at all as um, as a developer to have to use it like this. But you're you're able to grab you know and any of these uh, calculations that you have and those measures because they come from your model will accept the filters that is connected between your tooltip and the report, which is why when we're over here these numbers will change as we're hovering over it. We can see all these different values that will change between the visuals as we move over it. Um, and one thing that I've also done to make it very clear for clients is anytime I have a 
a measure in my tooltip and the smart narrative, I will usually give it an underline to help indicate that uh, this is coming um, from the model. So it just it helps to break up the text that's static versus the text that's dynamic. So to me, un, uh, a nice way is like you can maybe underline it or bullet it, but just to, to kind of help highlight that this value in your text string will change. Uh, the last thing that I'll mention into here before I leave it open for questions is the bottom visual that we have. So this is actually a good case, a good example of when a custom visual could be useful. So the um, the bottom visuals that we have um, is a bullet chart visual, and it's um, specifically what it allows you to do. It allows you to have two different uh, bars overlaid from each other, and I found that it was actually quite useful to be able to show subtotal versus grand total. So what this is actually doing is this grand total bar here is the equivalent of this value right here. It's the entire value for AdventureWorks. And then the blue value that's here is represented by this. Now in a perfect world, we could dynamically change the color to have this always be the color of whatever you're having over. But either way, it, it's giving you a ratio of kind of the subtotal to grand total to give you a different perspective of it. Like if you hover over these, you can see how how little this value is compared to the grand total of most of these. So it, it gives you a, a different perspective to basically look at your data. And the only thing that I um, did in the actual narrative visual tooltip is there's just two values in there. In this, if I pull up my fields list, we have regular sales, which is just, you know, standard sales amount. But the green value, the grand total, all that is is that is applying an all filter. So it's basically the all function, when I apply it as a filter in the calculate function, removes a filter for you. And it's removing the class filter. So that's how you're able to see the subtotal, but then for that other bar, it ignores the filter for whatever class it is and gives you the grand total for any of those specific um, companies. So there you go. My zoom, it, uh, it doesn't always work perfectly. So just to give you one last perspective, there you go. So that's how you're able to get that larger bar because that is ignoring the filter coming from any of these three filters for class that are in there. And that's how it's able to retrieve basically the grand total from that bar versus the subtotal that's in there. Yep. That one to yep, that one right there. So it's a nice little way to, to see it. And the reason I'm using a custom visual here is because uh, there's just no native visual that does this in Power BI. Um, and I just want to summarize this by saying that uh, I love custom visuals. It's one of the greatest features of Power BI is the fact that it's open source. Anybody can make a visualization. There's a marketplace for it, and um, they are very useful. But there are some downsides to them um, to play a doubles advocate for a second. So custom visuals in Power BI will always render a little bit slower than native visuals for security reasons. Um, when these uh, when your visuals load in the browser, you have kind of Think of it as two components for your visuals in Power BI. Um, when you, when the native visuals load, they have the ability to to access shared libraries from each other. So, the code library for the title, the background, the legend can be shared across native visuals to optimize um, load time um, when when it's loading within a loading within a browser. Custom visuals, because they are made by other companies, they are not owned by Microsoft. It's made by some third party developer. Uh, they have to basically load all their own libraries themselves. They can't sh access shared resources from other visuals because potentially there there could be a, you know a data leakage or something like that. So they you know to keep things secure, they don't allow that. So they'll render just a little bit slower because they have to load a few other few more of the um, rendering libraries themselves in kind of the contained box of that single visual on the page. So it's more of a word of caution. Just don't go building a report that has nothing but native visuals scattered around everywhere in it. Because if you do, sorry, uh, that has nothing but custom visuals in the report, because you'll end up um, adding quite a few seconds of load time to your report. If you use mostly native visuals, and every once in a while, when you need that one visual that uh, that needs to be a custom visual because it's, there's just nothing native in Power BI to support it, it's go, you know, go ahead and add one of them to your page. But just you know, be careful of not using too many because you can add unnecessary slowness to the report load time. Um, I went through a few things though. I talked about the using the button kind of at the top as a title. I talked about the 
uh, text box in the middle that allows the smart narrative to be included in there as far as calculations go. And then I talked about the custom visuals. Um, are there any questions on any of those three topics? Okay, uh, again, I have questions. Uh, sure. towards, the, towards the end, there are some people I know in the audience who, I don't know why they are not asking questions. I'm going to call them out myself. Uh, <laughs> but I'm just <laughs> letting them be for now. So my question is, uh, I hope it's not too early. If it's too early, you can let me know that you answer it later. It's about, I look at these and, you know, it's as if you already have an idea of how you are going to lay out everything. You know all what the, this is my assumption, like the customer has made clear to you all what they want to see and how they want to see it. And you don't run the risk of them suddenly coming tomorrow and saying, oh, we later change our mind. We don't want to see sales by brand. We want to, you know, sometimes some even go and maybe because they used to do this in Excel before they want me to use the exact kind of structure they had in Excel. So I used to struggle a bit with, should I just, when I'm building, not care about the design, not just the visual itself, but the design of the background and all, and maybe first of all, be done with all of the, the reports and then maybe ask for two weeks or some days to now do the design to gel. Or what approach do you take or do you design as long as you do the design? Because look at the two tips. Uh, I'll be really annoyed if the client suddenly says he doesn't want me to put the sales bread, the things I've attached the two tip to, and and then I look at I've done a lot of work and I'm like maybe I should just wait till the end. What's your own approach? I mean, in general, regardless of the client, almost never will you the first version of whatever you you present to them will be the final one, um, and and very often. Like you don't know whether or not something's going to work until you until you actually display it and then you realize, oh, actually, you know, that looks a little bit too busy. Let's tweak it here. Like that's just that's a natural part of development, um, you know, and, and with any client, like there, there's probably going to be three or four versions of the tooltip that I, that I might build before they we wow. finally settle on one that both <clears throat> has enough information to be presentable, uh, but also like meets their needs. Like that, it's just it's kind of a natural evolution of that. You know, I'm, I, I'd say like most pages will have at least three or four iterations. Um, even as with as many as I built, the client doesn't always know what they want until they see it and then they realize, oh, now that I've actually seen it and it's all built out, yeah, it's not quite what I want. Let's tweak this and this visual. These two visuals are fine. Um, overall, though, I also just follow a general approach. <clears throat> I almost always have some kind of a title or a banner section at the top. That's pretty universal. And, you know, it's kind of just built out one piece at a time and getting feedback from them as, uh, as I go through, you know, the just the standard development process. Thank you. Uh, every other thing you said, I was clear. That, that was really one I didn't know where to ask it. <laughs> so I felt it yeah, asked right that's now. That's fine. <laughs> All right. Um, let me pull up. We have about enough time to present one more, <clears throat> and then I'll leave it open for broader questions and stuff too. All right. So this one actually came across um, years ago when I uh, first built out my Google Analytics report that I have on my website. I, I came across this on Google's site where they had a heat map visual that was displaying by uh, weekday or day of week and hour of day. And I'm just like, this is a great visual. I love the distribution and the patterns that this is showing me with my data and, and where the clustering happens. Like you can see that you know, with the darker colors, a lot of the traffic, to, and this is just uh, it's two years old now, but this is uh, traffic to my website, um, you know, visits and all that. And like, there was definitely a, a pattern of a certain day and time of week where most of the, the traffic would come in, and then you can get further detail with the tooltip. So this is a great scenario of, can I do this with a native visual? Do I need a custom visual for this? We actually have an option to go. You know, we can get more visuals. Let's see if that opens up. Come on, there we go. And there is. There's an actual uh, couple of heat maps. There's, there is a table heat map visual, but as you can see, it is uh, not particularly uh, highly rated. It has also not been updated for a substantial amount of time, um, but it looks a little bit similar to that. But I downloaded that and I realized a couple of issues were the fact that it is just, you know, 
it's not very customizable. The one added benefit is you can, in, in the visual itself, create kind of a, uh, a color range in here, you know, as, as the legend that this does not have, but it didn't particularly work well. And again, if I can avoid using a custom visual, um, I, that's my preferred method to add these. So in this case, I'm like, all right, well, it, this is essentially a grid in a table design, and like I can do this with a matrix table, you know, or at least I wanted to see if I could try to do this with a matrix table. So I started out with basically exactly that. The matrix table itself <clears throat> just has hours on rows, <clears throat> and it has weekday on columns and page views in the value section. And there's some clever ways to apply conditional formatting to this to then get the achieved effect that we needed. So to start with, conditional formatting, and I'm going to go to background color. There we go. And I'm not actually going to use red and green because I, I want to avoid strong um, colors like that because they're not really bad in good numbers. There's just less lower and higher. So I'm going to go for more of a neutral uh, two-tone color, light blue to kind of a <clears throat> dark blue. There we are. Getting closer, but it's not quite the effect that I want to achieve. So the the thing that's still in there is my data labels. I don't need the numbers to show because the point of this is not to get exact values. It's to show the patterns with your data. If I wanted the exact values, I could hover to get it on the tooltip. So there's no option in the conditional formatting. If I go to the background color, um, if I was to design this, I would personally prefer to have a box that like checkbox here with information that says like sh show values or hide values, something where you could turn off the values in the background color formatting. It's not built into this, but we can achieve the same effect by applying two layers of conditional formatting to the table itself. If we go back to page views, go back to conditional formatting. If we apply font color as well with the same logic, light blue, dark blue. There we go. It essentially, because now I'm applying the same color to the background and to the font, it essentially negates, uh, you know, it blends them together and then achieves the effect of hiding the values themselves. So two-step process, at some point I would like them to kind of merge them in a way where I could just choose it from one menu, but it, it gets the achieved effect. And I also think it helps to show that even a table in Power BI can be turned into a visual. You know, it's a, uh, it's a very customizable um, visualization, the matrix table in there. There's a lot of things you can do with it, especially with conditional formatting, and there's many clever ways to turn that into some type of a visual that tells a better story with the data versus just staring at numbers on a page. Uh, pretty quick and easy to implement, but I think that the biggest catch in this is, oh yeah, you can apply it more than one conditional format at a time to one value um, in the value as well. So it doesn't just have to be data bars or just font color. I can apply, uh, in theory, I could apply all five of these. I could also add a data bar and an icon I wouldn't recommend it. That would start to get you know, fairly noisy and messy. Um, but just the two, background and font color together, has a nice achieved effect to give this grid output using a native visual in Power BI. Um, this one's a pretty quick demo, um, which is actually perfect around for timing. Uh, but are there any questions about the matrix table or applying the conditional formatting to get this effect? OK. So, uh... Unfortunately, I think today we had a smaller. Uh, is, today is a, is an Easter celebration. Oh, awesome! Someone's hand is up. Okay, thank you. Yes, John. Good evening. Uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, in fact, I think today's presentation is a bit complex for people. I think people coming in. So my question is. Visualization that has been that looks like a pie chart. Can it be a custom visual? I, I'm hearing you a little bit. Sorry, it's it's very very uh, loud, unfortunately. Oops. Okay. Uh, is, it, is it clear now? Better, I think. A little, a little okay. better. Yeah. Say say it again if you can. Okay. The visualization that looks like a pie chart. Before you start talking about this, there was a visualization that looks like a pie chart. Is it a custom visual or did you? I think this is I think I know what you're talking about. It is the um yeah. Yeah, yeah let me let me pull that up. Like, yeah, yes, yes, yes. Is it custom? It's called, or did you import it's called, it? it? It's called the it's a it's a terrible name. It's called the Chord Visual. C H O R D. Uh you mean this this one right here. Yes. 
This, yeah, it, but it, it yes, shows the relationship yes, yes, between yes. two things. So you basically have, it's a from and to, so you can see how much of the data from one set of categories goes to something else. So mine is from country, the class name. So you, you can see how much of Australia, you know, Australia's okay. uh, values goes to, you know, or in this case, regular. The regular is split up to mostly United States, um, and then it shows the distribution of a few others. So it shows the relationship kind of between two sets of categorical information. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, it's called the chort. It's a ugly name, but it is a fun visual. It's made by Microsoft, and it's in their, their custom visual store. But okay. I, I really like it. It's a, okay. it's a very okay. interesting way to display relationship between two sets of data. OK. Thank you so much. Absolutely. I think I see Thanks. a hand as well. Up. Or was that, I think that was the person who was just talking. I think so. Okay. And uh, at, this, at, at this point too, anybody else can, can also just ask general questions in Power BI um, as we, uh, we kind of close up for the day. And I'll, I'll throw up a slide that has the links and references for you. Beautiful. Uh, maybe even if I can find a way to copy them out and also paste in the Yep, uh, I'll, I'll do that in, in just, just, just a minute as well. Um, I'll get the... Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, oh, yeah. cool. Okay. There you go. So, yeah, so the QR code takes you to the main page, and um, let me... Your... I'll quickly copy and paste these. Oh, great. Teams, actually. I think uh, the questions are beginning to come. Someone's on his up also. Okay. What I'll just mention here is... Um, my website will have a link to the presentation PDF, uh, also links to um, both my consulting services. I just recently launched a new Power BI course on design um, That's uh, that has a link to that there. Uh, currently, it's, um, it's about 30, 35% off um, if, if you go to that. Um, I also provide a coupon code for anybody who goes to my website. If there's any files or templates that you find interesting and that work for you, uh, that this code just gives you a 30% discount on those, uh, and it's, it's available for one month. It's kind of a thank you to people who um, are just uh, uh, taking the time out of the day to come to a presentation of mine. So it's an appreciation of that. And um, links to the YouTube channel at the bottom. Again, I produce a video every, some, some video goes out almost every week of the year unless I'm on vacation. So tons of great uh, free content that can be consumed there. Great. Uh, I'm going to go try the coupon on something I found. <laughs> so I came across one of your templates on the app template the uh, on the power bi service so that mm, yeah the the, the app stuff. source yeah so i saw some of your work so damilari your hand is up uh yes you can unmute and you can fire away your question okay thank you thank you michael and thank you reed um very very insightful session so far I joined a bit late. Um, yes, so I mean, if my question had been addressed earlier in the presentation, you can just indicate so I can watch the recording. But I just wanted to find out um, if there are any general principles um, that you follow in, in the um, design of charts. Because one thing, um, well, maybe it's a peculiar challenge to me, is that there are a lot of um, visuals, but sometimes uh, you, you don't want to use something that would be difficult um, for your audience to interpret or that would um, yeah that will find that will make it difficult for them to interpret um, what you're trying to communicate because the essence of visualization is to communicate um, what you're saying so I wanted to know if there are any general um, design principles that you follow in, in developing um, your dashboards or your your visualizations Yes, there's one resource that I'm pulling up. Uh, let me pop that into Teams. There's a great visuals reference from SQL BI that's actually really helpful to picking the right visual for your for your data. So this thing, it's kind of a chart that helps to show, like, all right, what kind of what what are you trying to show? I want to show a comparison. I want to show changes over time, and it um, it doesn't have everything in it, but it it does. Uh, explain quite a lot of the visuals that are available both natively and custom to be like, oh, here's here's some really good visuals that will match it. Here's ones that work okay. Here's ones that you should not use for this type of, of um, presentation. So it, it it really helps to group things together by this by like the story and the and the data itself. And uh, it's it's a great guide to kind of help 
walk people through it. It's, it's a couple of years old now, but it still has a lot of visuals that are available today are still into here. Um, there's just a couple more now available than there, there was a couple of years ago, but it's a great starting place for helping to kind of see what visuals are good for showing what type of information. So it's something that I, I would recommend um, kind of as a good starting point if you're if you're trying to figure out how to tell the story with your with your data. Thanks for that. Uh, okay, can... thank you very much. Absolutely. And thanks, I'm Larry, for the question, because uh, that's one thing too sometimes. Mine, maybe from a separate angle, I sometimes you find out that maybe like three or four visuals, you think they will work well. <laughs> and then it becomes a case of uh, which one of those three should I use? And sometimes you, well, yeah, I think, what you said can be a tiebreaker. Okay, any other questions? Okay, uh, so I'm going to do some of the name mentioning, people I think I know. So Kelechi, <laughs> <laughs> you want to say anything? You want to ask any question? Which are the other familiar names I'm seeing? Some are left, maybe they are going to eat the, uh, the festive food. Okay. All right. So, Shakira, Onope, Oma, Manyi. Apologies if I'm not calling our names correctly. I just want to be sure that uh, you're asking your questions before I ask my last two questions. Uh, Kosi, I know Mr. John has asked, Mr. Damilari has asked. Uh, okay, there are two. So, Mr. Damilari Ojo. Uh, in fact, let me throw away the Mr. thing. People say, stop saying that. Uh, Aziz, uh, Chidima, IODG, anybody else? Questions before we go to the last questions of the day? Okay, so going one. Uh, if I get a three, then that's it. Uh, going two, going three. All right, so right, we've come to that okay. part of the session where we ask two questions that uh, to be sincere, even some people like to watch the recording just because of this last part of the session. So it's uh, we want to know your journey. How did you, you know, how did you even get to where you are today, and why did you make the conscious choice of even picking this niche and and being where you are today? We would like you to even go as far back as wherever you want, maybe. For you, it started while you were age one or age two. It makes it even much more interesting. <laughs> I mean, honestly, the the number one thing for for anybody wanting to get started with their own stuff is <clears throat> there's a degree of you need to you need to create, especially if you're a consultant. Like people people buy into you off of like the brand that you create. Like there there's a there's a signature in a sense that you have that if people want that you know, gives you your unique flair. And that most of that honestly comes from it's blogging. Like I. I started doing a couple of blogs here and there back when I worked for Power and Pivot Pro, um, another consulting company, and uh, I, I got into blogging. Uh, it also started to, to make me more aware. Like every time, every time I would figure out like a trick or a little a technique to do in a report that I thought was unique, I'd start writing those down. Like, oh, hey, I, I had to do this like interesting thing for this client. Actually, hmm, has anybody else done this? And I'll Google. Oh, this isn't really something that's been talked about. Okay, make a note. I should probably write a blog about this and. The more you do that, the more you just start to like write write down ideas every time you like you come up with something clever or, or unique or some interesting new way to do something, and um, you know it, it was it was hard for me to kind of like sit down. I couldn't just sit down on a day and just think about fun ideas, but they they normally come up naturally as you work. You know, you you hit you hit a, a sticking point in in development, and usually when you find a solution to that. That's going to be those those moments where wait was the solution is it unique? If it's a unique solution, that might be something worth doing a video on or writing on. And that's how you build up your brand. Is that at some point, you know, um, especially if you want to break out into consulting, you you need to give people a reason to pick you versus somebody else. And that comes from some type of reputation that you need. And and you either need to get that from two routes. You you need to have a lot of clients that. Can give you work, you know, referrals is word of mouth. Like, say this person is good, you know, certainly. But I'd say that's that's harder and takes longer to develop than, than blogging. You know, just writing an article, doing a short video, something to to start giving to, to giving a track record or a history of your expertise that's that's online in, in some degree. Because people need a way to be able to to see you know, what you've done 
whether or not it's through showcases or demos that you have published, like a, you know, an, a report that you've built and embedded, blogs that you've done, pr places that you've spoken at, um, a lot of user groups, and maybe even you guys do that. Uh, I know like the user group that I help run here, um, if, if somebody, anybody can present at it. If you have a topic that's really unique and you, know, you send me a description, oh, that's, that sounds like an amazing topic. Yeah, you can absolutely present here. Uh, you know, it's very easy just to, to offer, you know, um, get, give, have a topic and a title and, you know, qu quite a few user groups worldwide now that we're doing webinars are, would be very happy to have presenters with a, a unique idea to present on. And it doesn't even have to be an hour. Uh, you know, I've, I've um, ran my user group many times where we've had two or three presenters over an hour where each person just presents on a short 15 or 20 minute topic, little snack size things. And it's, it's just, those are all those good ways to get started, you know, whether or not it's making connections at user groups, uh, whether or not through blogging, but to, to build up that history, that kind of street cred in a sense, starts just by, you know, one, one event, one opportunity at a time. And, you know, that, like, that's how I grew it from there. I, I started with, you know, I, I had my first blog, I did my first user group presentation, and it, you know, they just grew um, over time from there. Great, great, uh, great summary in the, the chat. Oh, okay, you see. <laughs> yeah. Then I just want to also ask, uh, out of that question one, when did you, how did you come about the decision to try and, I see you've created a niche from not just even the Power BI, but deciding to focus on the visualization, that very important aspect of reporting that many of us, uh, we, we, we shy away from, or we, no, I don't know of anyone else who, who does as much amount of work in trying to share knowledge on visualization as you. Uh, I'm sure it's a conscious effort. You know, how did you come about that decision that, okay, I'm going to put out content in this area and look for more things in that area? person I will mention uh, right here. Powerbi.tips is uh, one of my other favorite. Like my good friend, Mike Carlo run, runs this website and he's the other one I would say is like, the this is the other website to go to for visual design and expertise. Um, they do a lot of other cool stuff. But to your question on why, um, the, like, how did I fall into this? Uh, I don't know, I got, most of my life, I've always had a bit of an eye for design. Uh, I, It's one of those things that I just pay extra special attention to. And I, I've now, like, I, I've read a substantial number of books and I've, I've tried to give myself some formal training on it, but it was more of just a situation where the, you know, for the companies that I worked for, people just kept coming to me more often than not. Like my, my boss would, if he had a report to present to a client, I would be the one who would come to like, hey, make it prettier, do do your magic. And and like, it, it was never something I I thought about is like, I didn't plan from day one. I want to specialize in, in, in aesthetics and design. It's, I just noticed that people continually kept coming to me more and more for it. As I figured out the tool, I would come up with clever ways to format it. And I just spent more time on it than others. And, you know, it, it just became kind of a, a natural evolution for me. Um, and like you said, I know there there are people that it doesn't come as easily to, but uh, there are uh, there are some books out there that really help. Um, I'm actually gonna grab one and show you a, a book that I would recommend. I just read it recently. So this, this book, uh, I, and I'll, I'll put the link into the title. It's called Solid, Outlined, and Hatched. So there, there is a there's a international con uh, concept called IBCS, International Business Communication Standards. It is kind of a an international standard of a, the right way to build visuals for understanding consistency for colors, consistency for in this case solid, outlined, hatched. Like what do the bars look like? What do the titles look like? What position are things and uh, it basically talks about normalizing formatting for visuals because if you're consistent, then people know when they see this shape, this shape always represents this. This color always represents this. It because it, it removes the confusion because you keep consistency with the patterns. Um, and it's a it's a very good book that um, is a, it's a very practical way to apply a lot of these kind of principles and practices. So I'm gonna put the link into um, the chat. Okay. Yeah. Oh. So there you go. Yeah, it is 
It's a fantastic organization. Um, this is the website. Let me uh, drop this into the chat for you. There you are. Yeah, they, they have they have a book. They also have actual courses and certifications. Um, so you, you can actually get like a, a certification as a consultant. But the book itself, just just on its own, is is still a great uh, reference for just understanding like some some patterns and other stuff that you want to display uh, in, in visualization themselves and and understanding everything about the layout, the design, uh, the way that you represent stuff. It, it's a it's a great starter, I would say. I'm going to go get the book also. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I think the second question is your your advice for people starting out, different levels of the journey. Uh, what was the question? So your advice for people starting out and maybe those who are already a bit into it. So how can we gain mastery? What's your I know you've mentioned uh, a few in the old things you've been saying, you know, but then again, uh, I don't know, maybe there's something else you want to say. You know, so that's why I'd rather you answer the question within the context of this question of what's your advice for someone starting out now? Uh, no, that, that's a good question. Um, I mean, if you're actually trying to learn Power BI, if, if it's, it's like getting started in the sense of um, just gaining knowledge, uh, there's actually the the place that um, I recently launched my video course on to Skillwave has it's it's ran by three other MVPs um, and and I'm I'm the fourth. It has a lot of really really good resources. So some of the best training I'd say honestly is is available here. Uh, I mean it's slightly biased obviously because my course is <laughs> my course is in there, but it has everything. Um, this whether is not the you want one. To learn Power Query, you know, modeling, learning DAX, learning basics. Um, like my my course is in there, but it, it's these are these are all like things that, are, from any aspect of Power BI, are really really good fundamentals to learn, just to be able to to pick up Power BI itself. Um, so you know, it's, at, at some point, like regardless of if it's ours or anybody else's, you it's really good just to go through a video course. Um, I, I put this one up here pretty highly. The other one that's uh, I already linked you to their their visuals reference SQL BI has some great DAX courses. Uh, however, they they get a little bit more advanced, so they're ones that I would. Um, Maybe say like do a bit later on, but they also provide many great trainings. Um, those are probably the the two links that I would say are some two of the, the best when it comes to. Um, you know, then yeah, they they're even modeling uh, showing it up here at the top. But between those two, uh, that's like almost anything you would need to learn in Power BI is as getting started uh, would be covered. Interestingly, uh, Matt also mentioned SkillWave. I think that was when he mentioned that. Uh, they had to get the best person in the visualization to come to the visualization part. And they mentioned the anyway, said, yeah. Oh, yeah, we were not wrong when we also came up on that, that conclusion. So I think oh, it was Matt Allen. Did, did yes, Matt Allington yeah. was he, he was at a previous okay, yeah, yeah. He, he's great. Last month. Yeah. So thanks a lot and uh, uh, thanks for giving us your time. Uh, I know it's a weekend and uh, it's been a very huge pleasure to have you here. Apologies, Absolutely. the number is smaller than what we normally get. Uh, it's a festive period here in Nigeria, so I think a lot of people travel. There are some people who I know were excited to be. There's even one of your, uh, what do they call someone who is really a, a fanatic? Like he, he, he mentions you everywhere. He's always, anytime he gives a session, he always talks about to learn this from you, learn that from you. I didn't see him here, so I know he's been on the road. And I know a lot of people too probably. We hear we travel sometimes for this kind of holidays. So, but they will watch the videos. So I'm sure uh, they will not miss out, even though they couldn't join the real life one. So it's been yeah, a pleasure. No Thanks a lot and uh, wish you a happy week ahead. So everybody who joined, Thank you for being a part of today's session. Thank you for staying to the end. And uh, all the links, and uh, you said the slide that is a place, I think you've published where we, you say we can go grab them too. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. It's um, uh, I, on my, the, the speaking uh, events page on my website has, okay, has uh, downloads for everything. Okay, great. So I'll make sure to send that across to also people who 
I'm going to send the recorded link to. So thank you very, very much. And it's been a very huge pleasure. I've learned a lot. <laughs> In fact, I can see my clients not knowing that you are the source of some of the things they will start noticing the reports I've been doing for them. <laughs> so thanks very much and uh, have a nice week ahead. Yeah, have a great rest of your Sunday evening.